Thanks for coming out. We're going to talk about any investments, so don't ask any investment questions. <laughs> this is kind of a chance for us to give back. Um, we appreciate everybody coming. We're lucky to have Craig McFarland here tonight, and he's an inspirational, motivational speaker that he's not one of these guys that's all rah rah. He's a person that really speaks from personal experience, and his situation is one that you can reflect on when the going gets tough because he's a guy that it's easy old cliche, but when the, when the going got tough, he got going. And the going has been pretty tough for Craig, so he's got enough story, I think, for everybody, doesn't he? Definitely. So, without further ado, let's get this thing rolling. Hi everyone, I'm Bob Costas. In my work, I come across more inspirational stories and people than you can possibly imagine. But what you're about to see and hear may very well top them all. I first met Trey McFarland in 1988. Back then, he impressed me as a young man with incredible spirit, energy, and ambition. His story is one of tremendous courage, of optimism, of devotion. In my lifetime, football has given me the confidence, the courage, and the ability to understand the youth of today. As a father, I am deeply concerned about the problems that our young people are facing in and outside the classroom. In the next few minutes, you hear from a good friend of mine whose life story is living proof that no obstacle is too great to overcome. Thanks, Walter. To gain insight into Craig's courage, let's go back and take a look at exactly what he's had to overcome. His life changed dramatically on a cold fall evening in northern Ontario in 1964. Craig was not quite two and a half. It was through the innocence of play that tragedy struck. Craig and several of his friends had put their hands on a striker. While twirling it, the striker was propelled and hit Craig in the eye. It was a simple, seemingly harmless device, which is used to light a welding torch. But it dramatically changed the course of the lives of each member of the McFarland family. Here's how Craig's mother remembers it. It was a time when all you could do really was hope and pray and put a lot of faith in God to answer your prayers that he would even live because it was given a lot of cortisone, which is a very strong drug, and our prayers were answered. He didn't have any complications, and he did live and has succeeded. Today, it seems Craig may well be capable of achieving anything. But back then, he and his family were at the mercy of the Canadian government. At age six, he was required to attend the Ontario School for the Blind. That was the norm in the 60s for blind children in Canada. Imagine any of us having to send off our first grader to a residential school hundreds of miles from home. What a tough decision. When you get sent away six years of age, you're almost 500 miles from home to go to school, not with your parents no longer with your brother, going to a strange school, get home three or four times a year. That's a heck of a shock for someone who's six years of age. The resources at what was then called the Ontario School for the Blind were far better than at many of today's small college campuses. It was in those facilities that Craig's new life began to take shape. During his 11 years of wrestling competition, Craig compiled a 93% winning career record. Not only were the vast majority of these victories against sighted opponents, but they occurred in eight different countries. From age seven on, Craig not only had the opportunity to meet the Joe Feismans and Bobby Orrs, but he himself was continually sought after by the media for interviews. By the age of 19, three documentaries had aired on Canadian national networks depicting Craig's unusual and amazing achievements on and off the mat. Craig's frequent interviews gave him tremendous ease and confidence in communicating with people. It was only natural that he became an articulate public speaker before graduating from high school. Even down through the ports and the cylinders, the top of the ground here, right there where we're here is six. You know, this is a cover, actually. Sure. The top of the ground is what discharges any pressure beyond 45 inches. This is one great guy. I tell you, I'm just, I'm just so fortunate that I met him uh, about four or five years ago, I guess. I knew a kid then. That's right. Uh, just um, watch 
people that he does with he's capable of doing, his desire to just excel and do anything that uh, anyone does. I mean, and better is a total inspiration to me, to a lot of kids, and a lot of them. One of the reasons Craig inspires others is that he actively seeks new challenges, even if it means there is the potential for failure. Craig doesn't always play it safe, that's for sure. He's a risk taker. I live my life to the fullest. I squeeze every minute of every hour out of every day. And I don't walk through life thinking of my blindness. Rather, there's nothing I won't try. I love having fun. And to me, I won't let anything stand in the way of my going out and living a very normal life. It's one thing to be an athletic champion. It's quite another to use those competitive qualities to excel with people. Early on, Craig developed tremendous people skills, charm and humor, and Lord knows he has tenacity. Out of great adversity can emerge great opportunities. Maybe that's the theme of Craig's life. Back in 1985, while attempting a backflip off a water ski ramp, Craig tore his hamstring off the bone. What intense pain. But the greater pain was having to drop out of the water ski show at Cypress Gardens because he had been incapacitated. It was during those days of recovery and rehabilitation that Craig redirected his life to pursue a speaking career. He quickly became known as Mr. Inspiration and traveled as a spokesman for a number of national corporations. Craig has established himself as a sought-after motivational speaker. He was part of the Reagan Bush All-Star Team and now has spoken at three consecutive Republican national conventions. His many travels provide him opportunities to develop friendships and relationships with a variety of executives and celebrities. travels in excess of 150,000 air miles each year. Traveling solo is often lonely. Behind the happy-go-lucky smile is an intense, sometimes driven young man. Much of that drive comes from a fear of failure, just as when Craig was back at the school for the blind, hoping to make it in a sighted world, he has that same drive today. <laughs> express your innermost feelings and it's a lot of fun. I don't think people realize how much work there is in recording an album. I love the process. I can't wait to get back in the studio. And the guys are great to work with. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Unlike so many blind people, Greg will not stay in a cocoon. He 
he won't deprive himself of any experience that a sighted person would enjoy. And you want to get medium rare, right? You got to
who have always been such tremendous pillars of strength to me. They always seem to be there when I needed them. Very supportive, very encouraging. But I never remember them pushing me, especially when it pertained to my athletics. And at six years of age, when I went to that school for the blind, 500 miles away from home, it was kind of a nervous feeling because you don't really understand why your parents have sent you there. You don't understand that that's the place you need to go to learn Braille, many of the other necessary skills that it would take to go on and become successful. So I kind of went through this stage of rebellion. And I believe that if there was a saving factor early on, it's one day, I was eight years old, his head teacher walked in the room and he came in the locker room and he put his arm around me and he said, son, I know you don't really like it here. And I said, sir, I'm glad you finally noticed. <laughs> well, he introduced me to the sport of wrestling. Of course, that's a, a huge sport out here in Iowa, but growing up in Canada, I really wasn't overly interested at eight years old in wrestling. I would have much rather played hockey. Of course, any Canadian boy has the same dream, I suppose. But blindness never afforded me that chance. And he explained to me, my coach explained, that if I got involved in wrestling, if it's the only sport where blind people can compete on an equal basis with sighted opponents, because it's a contact sport. So I believed that if I could compete and win against sighted kids, then eventually I'd have the opportunity to mainstream back into the regular school system. Well, I will not bore you with the details here tonight, but I wrestled for 11 years. I was fortunate enough to win just a little, over 93% of my wrestling matches. But yet, I don't think it ever really became a question of winning than losing. Of course, like anyone else, I'd much rather win. But I believe, regardless of what stage or what age we may be at in life, if we can learn to take the points of failure, if we can learn to take some of the frustrations, and I'll bet you all have frustrating moments in life, I know I certainly do. And to be able to use the down moments to simply serve as mere stepping stones to the possibilities and the opportunities that will lie ahead for you in the future, then I am convinced that we'd all be stronger people because of it. And you know, I believe when a person wakes up in the morning, I like to say you put your game face on. You try to put that smile on your face irregardless of how we feel because not every day is going to work out just quite the way we thought it would, and not every morning is going to be that great. But at least we can start curtailing that attitude if we start early on. And that's always been kind of the secret to my success. I always try to wake up in a great mood, and that means there is a lot of pressures the next day, a lot of challenges, but at least I'm ready to try. And speaking of try, when I was 13 years old, I was honored in Canada by the Prime Minister for my achievements early on in athletics. And you know, I was asked to say a few words that night. Well, I really didn't want to talk, and I said to the Prime Minister backstage, I said, Sir, just because I can wrestle doesn't mean I have anything to say. <laughs> well, he was the Prime Minister, so I lost the argument and I had to speak. Now, before I got up to speak, the Prime Minister decided to address or put out some of the political issues and fires of the day, so before he gets to my introduction, he gets into this long spiel, and by the time he introduced me, I had fallen asleep at the head table. <laughs> so from that day forward, I vowed I would never be as long-winded as some of those politicians, that's for sure. Well, I drew a bad straw that night, and I had to sit between Muhammad Ali and Joe Theismann at the head table. For any 13-year-old kid, that's a little nerve-wracking, I can assure you. And I brailed out the five letters in the word pride. And I had each letter represent a characteristic that was already in place in my life at the age of 13. And it stuck with me ever since. And I think it's something that, that you can take into your life. Many of you probably already implemented. You take the P in pride for perseverance. And I believe that perseverance is the backbone to anything and everything we try to do. In other words, it's what keeps us focused as to what it is we have to do today to be able to go on and achieve some of the goals that we have tomorrow and on down the road. 
And every time I think of perseverance, I, I think of my grandmother back in Canada who's 91 years of age, and I certainly know where I get my energy from because she's going strong and traveling and going and all these wonderful things by herself on and off the airplanes, and, and I think it's fabulous. But yet she's a person that's never been complacent. She's always believed that, that she can go on and, and accomplish and see parts of the world that maybe she never would have seen if she, if she didn't have that outlook. When I look at perseverance, I can recall doing all those sit-ups and all those push-ups every single day when I was involved in wrestling. And it wasn't just for conditioning, but it ran a lot deeper for me. I believe that if I could compete and win against sighted kids, then yes, I could mainstream into a regular school system. I also believe that I never wanted to give people the opportunity to say, oh, well, he lost because he's blind. I never wanted people to look at my blindness as a handicap, but rather to me in my life, it's only ever been just a minor inconvenience. And as you go through life, regardless of what stage or age a person might be at, there always will be inconveniences. And how we deal with the inconveniences in our life, I believe ultimately determines how successful we go on to become. And not just in a monetary sense, but success in attitude, success in spirit. Perseverance in my life allowed me not to give up. There's a lot of times that, that I could have used blindness as a niche, I suppose, to, to walk away from a challenge. But I believe when a person gets so far down that they quit, that they give up, that that's the ultimate form of rejection because it doesn't fix the problem, that's for sure. The R in pride is respect. And first and foremost, if a person doesn't have that sense of belief in themselves, then how can we ever expect others to believe in us? We have a gentleman living next door to my parents in Canada, and I suppose Ralph is maybe about 75, 76 years old, and every time I run into Ralph, he tells me the same story he's been telling me for the last two years. The guy's pretty sharp, too. He's trying to snow me, I think. He says, you know, I'm going to start walking. I'm going to get out and I'm going to walk. I'm going to go around the block three times. Well, last time I finally had heard enough. I said, Ralph, you'd be doing yourself a heck of a favor if you got around the block once. Because you haven't started yet. And it, because his procrastination is a little bit of a belief that he doesn't have it himself, that, that he can do it, or whatever the case might be. But, and then I was talking to my parents on the phone, and it was amazing. My little pep talk worked because old Ralph was just going by. <laughs> I believe it's a lot of respect for my parents, coaches, and teachers as well, though, that have spent so much time in their lives to make mine just a little better. And it's a lot of respect for my teammates and all the people that have brought me to where, to where I am today, and there certainly is a multitude of people that have been involved in, in my career. I think of Gordie Howe, the former hockey great that brought me to the United States in 1982 to live with he and his wife for a couple of years in Connecticut, and certainly without... Gordy's guidance and, and help bringing me to the United States, I would not be standing here this evening. The letter I in pride is my favorite, though. That's individuality. And every person in this room tonight is their own individual with their own separate identity. It's what separates one from another. It's what makes us special. Certainly, it's what makes us unique. And I got so tired of people in my life saying, you can't do that because you're blind. People saying maybe I wasn't good enough or fast enough or strong enough. All the, the criticism, believe me, I've heard all of it. But yet as an individual, I, I remain to stand on my own two feet to make my own decisions. And certainly I, I never got caught up in the people saying I could or couldn't. And I think of when I started water ski jumping. Apparently no blind person had ever ski jumped before. I was at Cypress Gardens in Florida in 1984. And CBS Morning News had come out of New York City to film me because they probably thought I was a little crazy. Well, I was fortunate enough to land and ski out of three of my first four jumps. Granted, the one I missed was not very pretty. But when I came back to the dry dock, I'll never forget the gentleman from CBS. He said, son, that really was amazing. Despite the odds, you did it. What was your formula? And I said to him very candidly, sir, it's strange you would say it that way, because if no blind person had ever ski jumped before, then who the heck made the odds? <laughs> <laughs> I really believe 
And people continue to set the odds for one another when they have no idea. How many times has someone set the odds for you? Maybe they say you're not healthy enough, you're not young enough, or whatever the case might be. And all of a sudden now people are setting those limitations on you. There's not a person in the room here tonight that knows more of what you're capable of achieving any more so than you. And when I was brought in a year ago to speak to, to the Notre Dame Fighting Irish for Lou Holtz, it was about exactly a year ago this time. Matter of fact, Notre Dame had lost two in a row. And we're in behind closed doors, and the first thing I said to Lou, I said, Lou, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I don't think an act of God could help you guys this year. <laughs> now, they had a rough year, and they're off to a rough start this year, too. I'm glad I wasn't there for that Northwest game, that's for sure. <laughs> I did have an opportunity as well, though, last year to speak to the Miami Hurricanes for Dennis Erickson three days before they played Florida State down in the Orange Bowl last September. And, and the reason why I mention that is because both of these programs have a lot of the next word, the D in pride, and that's desire. Desire is that simple eye of the tiger drive in life. It's a simple will to want to go out and do well. The will to want to succeed, the will to want to win. And winning for me is not defined by championships, but by the amount of effort one puts into it. And I've always said that showing up to anything is only half the battle, and that's the easier half. It's how one applies himself once they get there that ultimately will make the difference. You know, when I think of desire, I remember a few years back when I had opportunity to fly into Austin, Texas to play a little golf with Willie Nelson. Of course, that's back when Willie had a golf course to still play on. <laughs> now, after about three holes, I was up on Willie by about two strokes or so. It was a little tough to tell, though. I know for a fact that Willie was cheap. <laughs> we came to the fourth tee box, and Willie had had enough, so he proceeded to line me up over into the woods. <laughs> Needless to say, I don't make it a habit of playing golf with Willie too much. What ties together the perseverance, respect, individualism, the desire that helps fuel that fire inside every one of us is the E in pride, and that's enthusiasm. And enthusiasm can be measured by the smile that one puts on their face each and every day. Enthusiasm is the zest, it's the attitude, the spirit, and the passion that we live life with. And for me, I, I've always tried to live my life with a certain amount of enthusiasm because even in the darkest hours I believe that a little positive attitude and a smile on a face can go a long way. And I also look at something else for the E of pride and that's excellence. And I honestly believe that the race for quality in America has no finish line. Because if it did, if our quest and strive for excellence did have a finish line, we'd become very complacent. We'd rest on our laurels of yesterday because there'd be no reason to push and go on. And of course, we all know that that's not the case. In such a competitive environment today that, that, that everyone's pushing and many of your grandkids and kids are, are involved in that competitive marketplace, of course, today. And when I stop and look at the exciting things that are going on in, in my life today, I have been employed by Edward E. Jones now for five years. And my job is pretty much as a goodwill ambassador to travel throughout the United States and Canada. Now we have almost 4,000 offices throughout both these countries. And, and my job is to primarily speak to schools, service clubs, chamber of commerce functions, client nights, or, or functions as this here this evening. And to me, it really is an honor to, to be affiliated with a company that believes so strongly in giving back to the communities. Where, where we do business. And I'm grateful for John and, and Chuck to bring me into town. And I know we'll be out at the high school tomorrow. We have all the kids out there as well. And, and the Rotary Club before I cap off a great week in Iowa and, and head, back to, head back to Canada tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. When I also look at some of the neat things going on in, in my life, the book on my life will be released next year. That has been a fun process. There's a 41-minute video documentary that's being released as well, which is hosted by Bob Costas. You've seen a portion of that video earlier here, here this evening. When I recorded my first album in Canada a couple of years ago, again, it was kind of amazing, and all the so-called critics said I would never do it. And the album was, was a, a good success, and now there's plans in the works for my second album as well, and, 
the so-called critics have faded. But I'm always amazed at how people have a lot more knowledge of what I can achieve more so than I do. When I started snow skiing, I think this kind of sums up my attitude even today. I was living with Gordy Howe at the time, and I really didn't have much idea what snow skiing was all about, or how big some of these mountains were out in Colorado. And I showed up to the slope, and my guide skier was always skiing behind me. So he was yelling out instructions, and I was always skiing with this element of fear, like I was going to hit something. Now, later that morning, my fears came true when I ran into this girl and knocked her over, and I didn't know how to stop on these fool things to say I'm sorry or anything else, and I came crashing through that chairlift line. I was out over an embankment, and I wind up in the parking lot before I get stopped. <laughs> well, I was a little dejected and a little humiliated, to say the least. So as we're sliding through the chairlift line, I said to Cliff, I said, listen, why don't you ski in front of me instead of behind me? Perhaps it, it will allow me to ski with a greater sense of confidence and I'll be able to hear you in front of me. Well, as we get onto the chair, my idea at that point had just been going up the rope toe on the bunny slopes. It's our first time going up this chair and Cliff got tangled up on his skis and he never got on the chair beside me. <laughs> well, I'm kind of thinking, wait a minute, maybe this is some kind of joke. It comes back around and gets Cliff. I don't know what it does. <laughs> well, he gets on the chair behind me and he's yelling out all these commands from the back. And he's saying, listen, don't worry about anything. I'll count you down and you just slide off the chair. And I'll come alongside you in a few seconds. I'm thinking, wait a minute. He just told me all this stuff, how simple it would be, and it didn't work getting on the chair. Why should this? He counts me down, I bail off the chair, but to my dismay, I'm still eight or ten feet off the snow. <laughs> now I'm lying there in kind of a sense of agony, sense of frustration. The first thing that popped into my mind was that, golly, do people really enjoy this sport? <laughs> well, I did have Cliff ski in front of me. Well, it was fabulous because 21 days later, Cliff and I won the United States Blind National Snow Skiing Championships, which was my 22nd day ever on, ever on snow skis. And I think what it really goes to show is that it would have been so easy at the top of that mountain to give up. And I believe that sometimes we, we struggle through the valleys in life just to have the opportunities to climb the mountains. But it may not be all that it's cracked up to be on the way up that mountain. There will be those pitfalls along, along the way, and how we deal with them, again, I, I believe, has to come from within. What I'd like to do in a, in a few minutes, I, I certainly want to give you folks a, a, an opportunity to ask me some questions. I will say the highlight for me in the last several years is over the past 10 years, I've had the wonderful chance to speak to over 1,500 high schools throughout this great country, Canada, New Zealand, parts of Europe. It's been, a, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience helping instill a sense of pride and dignity in, in the young people of, of today. And the letters I receive it, it have, have just been tremendous. One of my future aspirations is to run for U.S. Congress out of Clearwater Beach, Florida in the next few years. And I've spoken at the last three Republican National Conventions and certainly look forward to, to the convention in 96 where I'll, I'll be speaking as, as well. When I stop, though, and reflect back on all the neat things that are going on in, in my life today, I can honestly say that, that I would gladly trade all the gold medals. I'd gladly trade the victories and, and all those championships that I've pushed myself so long and hard to go out and achieve. I would gladly trade every single one of them just to have the same opportunities that you have in this room here tonight. To be able to have my eyesight, to be able to see how beautiful the colors must be in a rainbow, to be able to see what my parents' faces look like, something I, I honestly don't remember, and to be able to even see what my little boy looks like. Maybe the things you take for granted as you walk through life each and every day, and that's even what trees look like. But despite as I travel throughout this great country, and there are those days that I can certainly get feeling a little down. I understand quite simply that, yes, there are so many people in this world that are a lot less fortunate than I am. 
And I remain convinced and committed that it's a responsibility and commitment of every one of us to want to reach out, to want to help, to want to make a difference in the lives of those who perhaps haven't been as blessed or fortunate as we've been along life's highway. And that's why I feel so strongly in, in going into these schools and speaking and trying to, to help out these kids as, as well. And before we go to questions, I can share, I'm sure a lot of golfers in the audience. I had the opportunity to play golf one summer in Michael Jordan's four-man celebrity scramble in Chicago. And we came to a par three where if you were fortunate enough to get a hole in one, you'd win a car. Well, I'm lucky to be on the green in one, let alone worrying about the hole in one. But that particular day, I hit a pretty good shot, and I, I ended up about six or eight inches directly to the right of the hole. And that night at the banquet, I received an award from the, from the newspaper, and the reporter said to me, he said, son, this must really make you feel special amongst all these high-profile athletes to win this award for closest to the pin. He said, how do you feel? I said, all I want to know is where the heck that guy is that lined me up. <laughs> but it has been a wonderful, wonderful career so far. I am thrilled to, to be in Iowa this week. We've had a lot of weeks actually in Iowa with Henry Jones over the past five years and I've enjoyed uh, much of it. I had the opportunity to speak to the Iowa Hawkeyes athletic program a few years ago and actually was pretty good friends with, uh, with Chris Street. So I certainly uh, have my, my ties, I suppose, with, uh, with Iowa. Again, I want to thank all, all of you for coming out this evening. We, we do have time for questions. I especially want to thank Chuck and, and John and all the support staff down there. They do a wonderful, wonderful job and I, uh, I'd be grateful to take your questions. You can uh, just yell them out, I suppose. If you raise your hand, your arm will get tired before I notice you. So <laughs> don't be bashful. Those kids at these high schools, believe me, are far from bashful today. So you can. Uh... Anybody have any questions? Don't be shy. We'll take them. No such thing as a bad question. Anyone? Do you have any vision at all? Do I have any vision at all? It's a good question. I do not. Actually, what I see would would be like, I suppose, me asking you, what does pure water taste like? And it's, it's not light or dark or black or white, but, but it's like an absolute nothing. And I think for a lot of sighted people, it's kind of maybe tough to envision that because when you close your eyes, you, you may see the color black or, or what have you, but I don't remember what color it looks like. I just know color by association, the way people have described it. Anyone else? Do you have a dog? When you're by yourself? I, I do not actually have a dog. Um, I think they're wonderful animals, but flying over 150,000 air miles a year, I wouldn't wish that on any dog. I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you know, Is your wife sighted? My, uh, my wife was, uh, was sighted. She's my ex wife, actually. So she's uh, off in Dallas and. Uh, and uh, my little boy, who well, he's not too little anymore, he's six years old and 90 pounds. But uh, he's living up in Canada with my parents on the farm, and he stayed with me when I got divorced. And uh, he's uh, starting his second season of hockey and uh, doing very, very well. Who have been some of your greatest inspirations other than your parents and say Gordy Howe? My greatest inspiration, my childhood hero growing up was always Mario Andretti. Mario's one of my best friends today. And, I loved his tenacity and I, I loved auto racing and I, I, I'm thrilled to find out that the person I thought and still think so much of didn't let me down with his uh, off the track antics like so many of these professional athletes do. I think Mario's always been a tremendous role model to a lot of people and, and I really admire him a lot. Anyone else? Oh, we got to We can't let uh, Frank go off this easy. Not this easy. Any more questions? Don't be shy. We'll take them. Anyone else? Well, I see you wrestled John here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a great wrestling state. I will say that. You know, some states you go in in the country, wrestling's not that big. But that's what I love about coming to Iowa. You know, people. They, I mean, they actually understand what wrestling's all about. It's, it's awesome. I think that's. Uh, here in Oklahoma, and it's, uh, 
You know, I have not actually met Dan Gable. We've tried to pull that off three times now, and I guess three times we struck out. But uh, I have met John Smith. I think you folks may know that name in Iowa. If you follow wrestling, you know, he's uh, been a nemesis in the side, I guess, of Iowa for a few years. <laughs> Anyone else? Do you know Tim Allen yeah. very well? Very well. And Tim's crazier than you could ever imagine. <laughs> Tim's a wonderful human being. I really, really enjoy hanging out with Tim and have the occasion to uh, quite frequently during the year. How did you come to work for Jones? How did I come to Edward E. Jones? I was with Putnam Mutual Funds for three years, and I really enjoyed the company as well and speaking to stockbrokers and so forth, but I, my heart kind of lied in, in speaking to the teenagers. And when I was talking to, to the managing partner of Edward E. Jones, we decided we'd try it for six months and see if it worked or not. And five years later, and now a limited partner with the company, and, and uh, I guess there's no turning back. Every August I get my schedule for the following year. We're booked through December of 96. So I don't know if that's job security or stupidity. I haven't figured it out. <laughs> Tell them about your first week with Edward E. Jones. Yeah, you know, my first week was, was really exciting. I, uh, it was kind of funny, actually. We were up in Montana, and it, uh, I heard a lot of good things about the company, but we showed up, and I get into the guy's car, three airplane rides from flying from Canada, and he's got his dog with him. His dog's, like, licking in my ear and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, that's, yeah, maybe it's all right. I don't know. And come to day two, and the guy, the guy picked me up, and he said, well, my... My wife's at work, and, and I'm pinch hitting. I got the three kids, and they were all like under five years old. And the one kid's throwing up in the back seat. And, and, you know, this is an awesome company. Let me tell you why. <laughs> but it did get better, believe me. It, it, got, it got a lot better. So I guess they figured we'll initiate the guy early, and then we'll uh, then, then then we'll get to the good stuff. But uh, they have been an awesome company to be affiliated with, and I. Uh, you know, when you think about it, we're not McDonald's and we're not Coca-Cola. We, you know, the kid can't, well, I guess he could if he wanted to, but I don't imagine he's going to run out and buy a mutual fund. I, I certainly wouldn't have when I was 15 either. But uh, I think it shows the commitment that the company has for the young people in, in this country that, uh, to, to give them a message that hopefully can help them go on to achieve. I know we did the alternative high school this afternoon over in uh, Atumwan. Those kids were full of questions, full of excitement, and if we could touch the lives of some of those kids, uh, maybe, maybe it'll help them out as well. One other thing I will say in, in reference to this whole investment industry, last year I studied for my Series 7, which is a stockbroker's license, just for kind of credibility, and so when I speak to our new, new investment representatives, I can beat on them a little harder when they go through training. And uh, I had 88 hours of cassette tapes. And I, I'm kind of an antsy person to begin with, and I plugged that first tape in, and I listened to side one three times, and all three times I fell asleep in the first ten minutes. <laughs> I was a little intimidated. I said, man, I got a suitcase full of these things. I'm going to be ten years doing that. Well, I had a change of heart, and I buckled down, and in two and a half months I studied and wrote my exam and, and, and passed it. But it was, um, it was kind of neat to understand that whole process. Anyone else? Any other questions I can take? Tell us a little bit about your, your golf. You play, uh, how you get uh, lined up. Uh, oh. What your typical sport is breaking over. Yeah, absolutely. Golfing, and without question, is the most frustrating sport that I've ever attempted. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I guess it is a lot of people, too. And, uh, I have someone line me up. They'll put the club head behind the ball, and they'll give me a distance. Let's say they say it's 180 yards. And I try to pull from something that I refer to as, as muscle memory, as to what the difference is, say, between 180 yards and 210 yards. And you acquire that through repetition. Hitting a ball, someone telling you how far it goes, and, and through the ability to concentrate, recall through muscle memory, hopefully that's, that's my way of, of playing golf. And my, my best score actually has been a 91, and, and it certainly goes downhill from there. But, uh, at least I have one advantage. I don't have to watch where that thing goes when I hit it. <laughs> I had a guy at Rotary earlier this week, and he put his hand up, and he said, Sir, do you, do you have any pointers for golf? He said, My golf game is just terrible. And I said, Sir, 
Just close your eyes. I, I have horrible handwriting, but I type. I, uh, through high school, I got to where I could type close to 100 words a minute. And uh, I, I do most of my exams through, through typing. Anyone else? How do you manage in the airport? Did you fly oh, okay, through airports, there's always ground personnel that, that will get you from one flight to another. I try to be as independent as possible, but there's always someone there to meet you. and. And when you fly as much as I do, you pretty much know them all by now anyway. Chicago and Detroit and all those airports I pivot through, there's, uh, it's mostly the same people meeting me week in and week out. So it's, um, those are people I have an awful lot of respect for, you know, coming back to the R and pride. I, like I say, there's a lot of people that touch my life on a weekly basis that I'm very appreciative of. What, what, what activity have you not tried that you would like to try? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I'm kind of a type of person, if it's in my mind, I'm going to go out and try it. So I, I would say the, the big thing left would be probably running for U.S. Congress. And that's been in my mind for a long time. With the timing, I feel, has, has not been quite right yet. There's a lot of things I still want to do and accomplish, but I will definitely take my, my shot at running for Congress in the next few years. Have you tried skydiving? I've not skydived. I have no fear of heights. Question on the left. Growing up in Canada, how how big are you fishing? Well, I I've uh, had my luck. I've had my frustration, but uh, certainly growing up in near Lake Superior and Lake Huron, I I fished uh, a reasonable amount and caught some fairly big fish. And I I love the outdoors. I grew up in a very outdoorsy type family with the hunting and fishing and camping. And, snowshoeing behind my father on the trap line at five, six years old. All those experiences were invaluable. Do you uh, play musical instruments? I played several musical instruments, actually. In high school, I, I played in the band. I played trumpet. I played trombone. I played some clarinet. I uh, played piano, of course, as my main instrument. And I, I really enjoyed music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the students you uh, sort of meet through the Years. Mm -hmm. Any observations, sort of uh, things you see from time to time, and how the students have changed over the years, and how the social uh, stresses that, that affect you? Yeah, that's a good question pertaining to the kids of today, of, of some of the pressures they're facing. And, and first, let me say, I think the kids growing up today, it's an enormously talented, gifted uh, generation, and, and sometimes it needs a little guidance, I'm, I'm sure, but you know, technology today has has really changed, uh, I guess, the, the kids to a certain degree. You know, they uh, there's a lot more things at their fingertips, a lot more readily available. I know when I was a kid, you know, if you had two or three old Tonka dump trucks in the sandbox, you were pretty happy. And today it's uh, Nintendo and NES, and two years from now that's outdated, and they want the Game Boy or Game Gears or you name it, they want it. You know, so I mean, it, it's a little... It's a little different, but in the same context, I think that with so many latchkey kids and uh, many parents both having to work to make ends meet, it has had an enormous, enormous negative impact on the kids growing up today because they oftentimes go without leadership, guidance, so many split homes, they don't have the same role models in the home as they once had, and, and, and talking to so many principals, one of their biggest complaints is is the home life of so many kids. They're kind of behind the eight ball before they ever get to school. And school was never meant to change the lives of these kids in 30 hours a week when the rest of their lives are in turmoil. It was it was to give these kids an education. And oftentimes it's, it's tough when a kid can't show up with a clear frame of mind because of the home environment. So I, I, I feel for some of these kids, but yet many of them are continuing to persevere and, and hopefully they'll get out of that environment and, and go on into college. Anyone else? Any questions? If not, I uh, I want to thank certainly Chuck and uh, and and John for the wonderful 
uh, time here tonight. I, I guess we, we have some uh, desserts uh, over here to my right. And someone going to say some words about that. I'm sticking around if there's desserts. I guarantee you that much. <laughs> Being a Canadian and making that maple syrup and all that stuff, I got a sweet tooth. So I, but I want to thank all of you for coming out. And even the folks who are not affiliated with Edward Jones, the civic leaders and folks that have taken time out of your schedule, it's a wonderful community. And I'm honored to be in town. And if there's ever anything we, we can do for you, give uh, John or Jeff a call. And, I hope you'll enjoy some desserts in this. You want to say a couple words? That's great. Frank, Frank, I just wanted to ask you a private question. That is, uh, anybody here got any personal problems that they'd like to <laughs> talk to Frank about? <laughs> Other than my golf <laughs> I've played golf with Bob Greco and uh, Ken North before, and I can assure you, uh, neither one of those guys ever came close to a 30, 35-foot putt like <laughs> 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 And uh, these guys are kicking it and everything else. But I'm going to try closing my eyes. <laughs> now the thing is, any anytime Bob putts, everybody else closes their eyes. <laughs> Craig, that was great. Nice. On behalf of John and I and Debbie and Diane, and Barbara in the back, uh, we are so proud to have you here. I heard Craig the first time seven or eight years ago when he was representing this other company, and I was awestruck at that time, and I knew that we needed to get him to Fairfield uh, sometime, and it's really through John that we were able to do it. So this has been terrific. And we certainly hope that everybody uh, feels that this is worthwhile to come out tonight. Yeah.